The condition of God's people, not good. It was not good. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery. And as we discover the Bible, we're learning some things about Lamentations chapter 5. This is a book that was written by Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. And uh, it is a really interesting read as we focus on this listening to God. Corey and Ryan are also here. Corey. All right. Well, as promised today, we are going to be taking a look at the temple menorah and trying to track it through history. Ryan? Well, in Lamentations, Jeremiah repeatedly uses the phrase daughter of Zion, but who is the daughter of Zion? Very good question. Excellent. They're coming up in about 12 minutes. Janice. Today, our hope and trust. All right. So take your Bible guide and turn to the most important book of all. That's the Bible. And when you do that, let's get ready to listen to what God has told us through the book of Lamentations in chapter five. Lamentations 5, 1 through 9. Remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Look, and behold our reproach. Our inheritance has been turned over to aliens and our houses to foreigners. We have become orphans and waifs. Our mothers are like widows. We pay for the water we drink, and our wood comes at a price. They pursue at our heels. We labor and have no rest. We have given our hand to the Egyptians and the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread. Our fathers sinned and are no more, but we bear their iniquities. Servants rule over us. There is none to deliver us from their hand. We get our bread at the risk of our lives because of the sword in the wilderness. Lamentations chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. You know, Lamentations is a great book when we're studying something like the wilderness. <laughs> it really is. Uh, this is the last chapter in the book of Lamentations, chapter 5. And it's really, really something. God, he does not stop working because the times are evil. No, no. Through all the fall and the captivity of Judah, we get to see this. The fall of Judah prompted Jeremiah to write the painful and emotional book of Lamentations. And it speaks about the difficulties that the nation would face through the serving of their enemies in captivity. However, this time was also when the great prophets Ezekiel and Daniel were called to speak amazing truths, and they did. We're going to read about that in a couple of days. Their unique ministries happened in the face of great evil. God wastes nothing. Even when we feel like it's all lost and it's all gone, like our lives are being totally lived in futility, God's answer is always hopeful. We need to remember that God speaks to us wherever we find ourselves because he has placed us there, good or bad. God is here. And that's really true. I remember uh, there was a time when we were looking at um, a person and, and uh, we were looking at their testimony. They were from the uh, war, World War II. Back in the day, I was producer of 100 Huntley Street. And um, they said, well, I was in a Japanese prison camp when I met the Lord. I said, really? They said, yeah. I said, how did that happen? He said, well, we were, we were being starved to death. And I just wanted to die. But he says, I was afraid. So he said, I, I, I didn't know. I heard about God, but I prayed, oh, Lord, if you're out there, help me. And the one called Jesus Christ, if you're there. And God saved him. And he said, I was so freed from the burden of sin. He was starving to death, and yet he was freed. He felt great. And he said, I just wanted to be baptized. And he said, Lord Jesus, help me to be baptized. And you know what God did? He brought a rain shower. And through the prison 
through the jail of the prison, the rain covered him. And he raised his hands and his entire body was baptized. Now, I, I just want to tell you, that was an amazing story. And uh, he's in heaven now, but that is something else. No matter where we are, God is with us. Remember, take your Bible guide and turn to this. If you don't have one, write to us or call us and we'll give it to you or go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click on it. It'll take you to a page where you can download it. But Father, I pray today as we look at the nine verses of chapter five, you would help us to hear what your Holy Spirit is saying. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at chapter five. Look, look at the first verse. This is awesome. Here's what it says. Remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. <laughs> look and behold our reproach. Remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Look and behold, take note of our reproach. Our inheritance has been turned over to aliens or people who are not in our nation and our houses to foreigners. We have become orphans, wafts. Our mothers are like widows. Now, the condition of God's people was not good. Our circumstances should not direct our actions. Only God should. Our circumstances should not direct our actions. You know, Christians are people who respond to Jesus Christ by following him. Jesus Christ was never dictated by his circumstances. He just changed them. <laughs> he changed them because he could and because he knew that circumstances would drive human nature. Jesus Christ confronted those circumstances with his will, with who he was. And beloved, whatever situation we're in right now, whatever difficulty we're having right now, wherever we are at, we should not be driven by that difficulty, but we should be driven by the fact that God hears us. Jeremiah said, hear us, O Lord, take note. God sees us, hears us, understands. We need to pay attention to that. Look at verse four. It says, we pay for the water we drink and our wood comes at a price. They pursue at our heels. We labor and have no rest. We have given our hands to the Egyptians and the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread. It was not the people around Judah that would save them. Only God could. Now, beloved, listen carefully. Listen, listen, listen. We look to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation through Jesus Christ alone. There is no one other than Jesus Christ. He was the only one who is fully God and fully man. He is the only one who is worthy because God called him. And that's exactly what we need to remember. So when we pray and we seek God's help, we are, we pray, Lord Jesus, thank you for forgiving me. Only you could do that. We put our prayers and our thoughts to God. We don't put them to a political party or a social movement, or something of that nature. We put them to God if we are Christian. Now, this is verses 7, 8, and 9. Verse 7 says this. Our fathers sinned and are no more, but we bear their iniquities. Servants rule over us. There is none to deliver us from their hand. We get our bread at the risk of our lives because of the sword in the wilderness. The circumstances had changed for the nation of Judah. Very different than it was when we started reading in 1 Kings, isn't it? And Samuel. God will help us through any circumstance. God will help us through any and every circumstance. Now, I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know what is going on, but I, I do want to pray because that's what we do when we read the word of God the Lord speaks to our heart. We need to pray and ask the Lord to help us. So Father, I, I just come to you today and I pray. I don't know what circumstances the wonderful viewers, the beloved viewers who you love and you see, I don't know what they're going through behind the computer, behind the phone, behind the TV, behind whatever. 
But I know, Lord, that you see them. I know, Lord, that you know them. So right now, we come to you and we say, Lord, help us, see us, and we submit to you. Help us to do your will, your way, in the situation we're in, because if we don't, we'll have a problem. We've got to do things your way now, Lord. So help us to do that. So Father, we repent and we say, Lord, we need to start doing things your way. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, we will. Help us, Holy Spirit, now. Guide us and direct us. Keep us close to you as we go forward. And we understand what your word says. And so we're going forward based on your word, not based on anybody saying anything to us, but based on what you have told us. Hi there, Bible Discovery TV is available to you 24 seven. If you have Roku, you can download our app and you can watch all of our programs at your own convenience. We're also available on Amazon Fire. So just search Bible Discovery TV and you'll be able to find us. Did you know that Bible Discovery TV is available on your phone? You can watch the program whenever and wherever is most convenient for you. On iPhone or Android, search for Bible Discovery TV in the App Store. Okay, so on yesterday's program, we took a look at the destruction of the temple and the capture of the temple art artifacts by uh, Babylon, and then traced that through history as far as we could go. Today, we are going to do a similar thing, but we're going to be focusing specifically on the temple menorah. Now, remember that this isn't the same menorah that Moses created, although that was stored in Solomon's temple, uh, but remember, that King Solomon actually made 10 golden menorah because he was, he was a pretty extra guy. Take a look. The biblical menorah or multi-branched lampstand had its origins with Moses who constructed it in the wilderness. Later, King Solomon made 10 lampstands for his temple in Jerusalem, which also may have housed Moses's original menorah. These lampstands are believed to have survived to the time period of the Babylonian destruction of the temple or until the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, who raided the temple and set up an altar to Zeus in it. This infamous act inspired the Maccabean Revolt, which ultimately restored the use of the temple and saved the objects. Regardless, the temple was finally destroyed by Rome in AD 70, an act remembered by the Ark of Titus and the records of an eyewitness, the Roman historian Josephus. He records that on top of spoils of war, a Jewish priest bought his life by trading temple treasures to the Romans, including at least one menorah from the temple. The treasures were then displayed in the Roman Temple of Peace, and there are second century eyewitness claims of seeing the veil of the Ark of the Covenant, the high priest's breastplate, and the menorah in Rome. By the Byzantine period, there were rumors that the temple treasures were somewhere hidden in Rome. And by the medieval period, legends grew to specify that Christians had hidden them. Perhaps this is the beginning of a popular belief today that as inheritors of Rome, the Vatican is hiding at least the menorah. History, however, is not entirely silent on this. Despite the Temple of Peace being destroyed by fire in AD 192, a Byzantine historian writes of two potential places that the menorah could have ended up. It could have returned with the victorious Visigoths after their sacking of Rome, or it could have gone with the Vandals of Carthage, who also sacked Rome. When Emperor Justinian's general then defeated Carthage, he is said to have brought back with him the temple treasures of the Jews. Did the menorah end up in Justinian's capital, Constantinople? Another record claims Justinian believed the treasures were cursed, so he sent them back to Jerusalem. Interestingly, he did build the massive Nia church in Jerusalem. Could this have been a place to house the long lost treasures of the second temple? So there we go. Obviously, there's a ton more to be said about uh, Judean history and Israelite history during these various time periods, but this was just kind of like a brief general overview on uh, how to track these things. Very good. Thank you, Corey. All right. Well, Ryan, let's go. All right. Well, today I want to talk about a phrase used over two dozen times in the Bible, and that is daughter of Zion. As a matter of fact, in Lamentations, Jeremiah uses this term nine times in just five chapters. And one of the most interesting occurrences of Daughter of Zion is found in Zechariah 9.9, because it also makes reference to her king. So the question is, just who is the Daughter of Zion, and who is her king? Mm -hmm. 
Daughter of Zion is a phrase used in the Bible about 30 times, and all but two of these occurrences are in the Old Testament. The first time this phrase is used is in 2 Kings 19.21, while the final occurrence is found in John 12.15, though it appears most frequently in the books of the prophets. In particular, Isaiah, Micah, Zephaniah, Zechariah, and Jeremiah, along with his book of Lamentations, which uses this phrase a whopping eight times in only five chapters. This is second only to Isaiah, who has nine occurrences. Significantly, the only two New Testament occurrences, which are in Matthew 21.5 and John 12.15, are both quoting Zechariah 9.9 and connect his messianic prophecy regarding the daughter of Zion's king, who comes upon a colt to Jesus of Nazareth. And while Matthew and John don't leave us guessing who the Messiah is, the question that remains is, who is the daughter of Zion? Well, before we can know who the daughter is, we first need to know what Zion is. Now, the name Zion first appears in 2 Samuel 5, and according to this passage, was the name of the original mountain fortress that King David conquered and took from the Jebusites after he became king. So if Zion is the mountain fortress, then who is Zion's daughter? Well, back in those times, it was customary to refer to the surrounding cities and suburbs of the main fortress or city as daughters. And the city that grew around Mount Zion was Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is the daughter of Zion. However, as the Bible goes on to explain, following the reign of David's son Solomon, the kingdom of Israel split. 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel became Northern Israel, referred to as simply Israel, and the two remaining tribes of Judah and Benjamin became Southern Israel, referred to as Judah, with Jerusalem as its capital city. And so when the Bible refers to the daughter of Zion, it's often not only referring to Jerusalem, but the whole Southern kingdom of Judah, since Jerusalem is the capital city and the seat of its power. We often do the same thing with modern kingdoms as well. For example, we could refer to America as simply Washington, since that is its capital city and the seat of its power. Likewise, Canada could be simply addressed as Ottawa. So Daughter of Zion refers to Jerusalem and by extension, all of Southern Israel. Significantly, the Daughter of Zion miraculously still exists to this day. And as Zechariah prophesied long ago, she will one day look upon her king on a colt, Jesus, the one whom they pierced and mourn and finally accept him as their true Lord and Savior. So Daughter of Zion is another name for Jerusalem and by extension, the whole Southern Kingdom of Judah. And as Matthew and John point out in the New Testament, her king that Zechariah sees riding on a colt is none other than Jesus of Nazareth, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and God of Gods. It's very, you know, this is all very interesting. One thing that we need to remember is that we're going into Ezekiel, then we're going into Daniel. And these two prophets are over in the Babylonian area. And uh, they're going to prophesy and they're going to speak. They already are. And uh, what's important to remember is this is the time of punishment for Judah. And so this is all God's will. And these lamentations and everything we're talking about and, and all of this is God's will. And we need to keep in mind that God has in his plans things that don't necessarily feel good or look good to us. God is not programming our comfort for his will, but we are called to obedience. Mm -hmm. And when we obey him, sometimes he takes us down a, a path that's very dark and we are responsible for that path. And so in those cases, we need to say, yes, Lord, we need to come back to the Lord and examine ourselves and say, what's, what's gone wrong? Now, the reason I say that after your segments is because we're in a time right now in this country and in the country of the United States of America, when we need to ask the question, Lord, where are we wrong? Help us, forgive us. Many times we know what's wrong, but forgive us, Lord, and we need to come back to the Lord. So that becomes very important. And that's what we need to do. This is the time we need to think about that. You know, in that, talking about that, and we can you know, open it up here, uh, for discussion as well, is that it needs to begin here. Our hearts. You know, it needs to be in here. It's not something that we need to start pointing out at each other or going after different denominations or or different um, governor, governmental yeah. Yeah. persuasions, organizations, organizations yeah. and things like that. It, it, it begins here. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when we're reading through the scriptures, it God comes to his people. 
first, mm -hmm. doesn't he? God comes always. to his people always. He's That's not going to the first. other nations. He doesn't expect that there. He expects it to those people. Here, it was his nation Israel in the Old Testament. And after Jesus came, it's still Israel, but it, it, it's it's to those who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ mm -hmm. to follow who him. Are in God's that kingdom. they're saying, you've given your life for me. I now... I die in Christ. Yeah. I I want to give you my life so that I can follow you. And that's where it needs to begin. And sometimes yeah. we get knocked off kilter, right? And and it's a it's a growing process. It's not something that we just say magical words and all of a sudden a magic wand and we're changed and we're great people. Absolutely not. The work of Christ was completed on the cross, but it's a lifelong journey mm -hmm. for us to learn how to follow the Lord God. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult. It especially goes today, in today's culture, uh -huh. especially. But it, it goes yeah. against not only our own human nature, but it goes against our culture. And it even goes against the culture that we think, like the, the culture that we're, we're oblivious to in some ways, because I, I think a huge trap right now that we're, that, that we all face is that we go to other people, whether it's Christians, whether it's political commentators, whether it's uh, different teachers, we have so much access online, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and on TV to, to different opinions. Yes. And we use opinions of people that we like mm -hmm. to inform our own opinions. And the problem with that is that our opinions are supposed to come from That's this, right. from us and God. Righteousness. So who are we following? Are we following a political commentator who may share faith background or may not share a faith background? Are we following a pastor who we respect? Are we following? And there's nothing wrong with listening to those people mm -hmm. and, 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 and hearing their opinion but we have to bring it back to God and allow God to inform our opinion. And that's what we see right? in yeah. the scripture. So, mm -hmm. so we have to follow God. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line. Yeah. We have to say, Lord, what are you saying? I want to do what you say. Yeah. So that's the question. This And this is where I'm, and I'm glad for this discussion because, and Ryan, you can jump in at any time. I see sometimes you it's like, <laughs> don't, 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 don't jump in and, and, and we're right there, but um Looking at this chapter five in Lamentations, we see that Israel had lost her inheritance and suffered unrest. And there's that word again. They suffered unrest because she made alliances with Egypt and Assyria. Mm -hmm. These policies showed that Israel was placing her trust in man mm -hmm. rather than in God. They were the people of God. And that's where their first communication should have been. That's the same thing. And this Lamentations 5, verses 1 and 5, Remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Look and behold our reproach. Our inheritance has been turned over to aliens and our houses to foreigners. We have become orphans and waifs. Our mothers are like widows. We pay for the water we drink and our wood comes at a price. They pursue at our heels. We labor and have no rest. We have given our hand to the Egyptians and the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread. Mm. Mm. <laughs> they thought their help would come through mm -hmm. Egypt, through Assyria, through men, through their own policies. They had forgotten and they lost their rest. It's Isn't like, that interesting? It's like yeah. Psalm 121, I look to the hills and where does my help come from? He's looking at the hills. And then the, the, we read the original Hebrew and it's like, it doesn't come from the hills. It comes from God above. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the Bible says that, listen, man shall live on every word of God. Mm -hmm. Now think about that. God has provided for us. He's given us everything we need. If we listen to him, if we say, okay, Lord, I'm not going to you know, look to raise my paycheck or to do that. I need, help me to hear you. Help yeah. me to hear you. Yeah, it's it's by faith, not by sight. And you know, when you look at, they're looking to Egypt and Assyria. Those were, they were very uh, incredible kingdoms. Mm -hmm. You know, humanly speaking, I mean, amazing kingdoms, right? So when you're looking with your eyes, you're you're thinking, yeah, they've got all the military power. They've got all that. It makes sense, right, from a human perspective. Yep. But we're we're called to look to God. And, and oftentimes, the things that we're told, the way that God and Jesus lived His life. And, 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 and said, blessed are the meek. Mm -hmm. and, and all of these things, you're thinking, what? wait, that, that, that's just so not, that's just backwards. Mm -hmm. How can that work? But that's a part of it. It's this faith and trust and hope in God. And, and back again, you know, I, I said a, 
I think that was just yesterday, reading from uh, uh, what Jeremiah had said, the Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I hope in him. That's where Jeremiah's hope was in everything that he saw and all of the messages of judgment that he was bringing to the people and they weren't listening. But he says, I hope in him. He says here, the Lord is good to those who wait for him. Ha ha ha, that's not easy to do. That's not easy to do. To the soul who seeks him, it is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Wait quietly. Mm-hmm. Oh man. It is good for a man to hear to to bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone and keep silent because God has laid it on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let let him give his cheek to the one who strikes him and be full of reproach. For the Lord will not cast off forever. Though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he does not afflict willfully nor grieve the children of men. Remember that through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. For his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. We have a new network online and I just want to tell you that uh, we've got a lot of friends on it, a lot of people we like and all of that. And you can watch it 24 seven. You can watch it when you go to sleep, leave it on your on your computer or your TV set, on Roku channel, on uh, Dropbox, wh- whatever, whatever you have, you can get to it, your Apple TV, whatever it is. So Bible Discovery TV, Bible Discovery Network, Bible Discovery Network, Bible Discovery TV is where you find it. Lord Jesus, we come to you today Help us to follow you.